What is this? Uh, it looks like I see, uh, yeah, that is that is what I think I see. Some breaking news in the portal on this Thursday night, April 18th, the year of our Lord, 2024. We're live, as live can be, from Coral Gables at the University of Miami. I got a one-on-one with Mario Cristobal that is extremely lengthy, coming up a little bit later. But in the meantime, yep, just about 30 or so minutes ago, some of that stuff that uh, some people were saying may or may not happen, it started to happen. I've got full portal intel. We're jam-packed. We're high atop a gorgeous Miami, Florida on this Thursday evening. So I got to talk about that. I got to talk about some other guys already in the portal. So we're going to get the whole portal intel scoop and whisper sting out the way early. I need to discuss with you all what in the world's going on at Colorado. What in the world is Colorado going to be? Deion Sanders has been saying a whole lot. People have been questioning him a fair amount lately with the portal goings on out there. And I got to be honest with you, I'm not going to do the knee jerk thing, but I got some pretty strong general feelings on how this sport works. And I think a lot of them apply to Colorado right now. So I'm going to talk about that. I got a question about the concept of repeat champions. And since we're expanding the playoff field, how much more likely that could be or less likely that could be? Is anyone going to put together a dynasty in the near future in the expanded playoff era? So we got that. Of course, we got Mario one-on-one. That'll be the back half of the show. And we are jam-packed, man. We are loaded. We have had a great, great day down here. They're watching us in Micanopy, Florida. Probably noticed that name from the John Anderson hit single Seminole Wind in the early 90s. They're watching us in Fairdale, Illinois, Johnson City, Tennessee, Soso, Mississippi. If you're not following on the socials, frankly, shame on you. No, I, I'm, I kid, but you should be following because there is a ton of behind-the-scenes content that we got today. We've, we've been on the road all week, uh, but we got it today in at Late Kick Josh. You look at that Instagram story right now. It's lit up to the degree it normally would be on a game day in the fall with a lot of the behind-the-scenes stuff. So we got that going for us very shortly, maybe tomorrow, probably over the weekend, I'm going to begin to announce the next two stops we have on the Pate State Speaker Series. We're going to go two places next week. Big time programs. You've been asking us to go to both. Fan bases have been very vocal. Uh, We've listened. The staffs there have listened. And so we're going to be on the road again next week because, as I told you, if CBS ever gave us the resources to do this, we would literally never come off the road in the spring. There's a suitcase right over here behind Gelby, and I've been living out of it for like two months now with no end in sight. Let's dive into the show. Transfer portal got a little bit spicy on this Thursday evening, breaking news just in the past hour or so, and it's out in Tempe, Arizona, actually, at Arizona State, where Jaden Rashada is entering the transfer portal. Now, you remember the front end of his recruitment. You remember goes to Florida, looks like he's going to Florida. That whole thing falls through, ends up at Arizona State. And so last year it was really up and down, had some injury concerns as well. So in the past hour or so, news is broken that he enters the portal. Now, I know on first glance you may look at that, and since a lot of you probably don't watch Arizona State football week to week, you probably sit there and say, oh, that's a huge deal. That's probably a death blow to them because you probably think that's their starting quarterback. And uh, with good reason. It was last year. I'm not so sure that was going to be the case this upcoming fall. Because here's what I think most of you have been too busy to do. Most of you, because you have lives to live, have probably been too busy to track Arizona State spring football. But as you know, I have no life other than this. So I get to do that for you. How many of you know the name Sam Levitt? Say, I didn't see many hands raised, okay? Other than Gelby, he raised his hands. But I didn't see many other hands raised. Sam Levitt, I think, was going to win this starting job. And I think it became pretty clear maybe in the last week or so of practice out there. And I think Jaden Rashada may have made what he would feel is a business decision. Now, you can, again, think about that whatever you want to. You can think that that's cowardly or you can think it's smart. You could think it's short-sighted or you can think it's brilliantly tactical i I don't really care because like i'm not Jaden rashada i'm not his father uh we can all have opinions on it but this is going to be a headline rinse and repeat every year because it's the new world of college football i think sam levitt was going to win that job i still think he's going to win the job overwhelmingly now i think arizona state's probably going to be in the market for a third quarterback at the very least because the depth chart does take a hit there but where's Jaden rashada going to go where in the world is Jaden rashada headed former elite, highly rated quarterback, and where is he going to go? I think there's going to be an assumption that Jaden Rashada goes somewhere he thinks he can immediately start, and that I'd hit the brakes on. I think maybe you could look at a little reset here, not just on the Arizona State side of things, but also with Rashada. I wouldn't assume that he's looking for a place he can go start immediately. 
I'd have you pay attention to what Dante Moore just did. Dante Moore just started at UCLA. What did he do? He transferred and he went up to Oregon. He ain't going to start at Oregon this year. He knows he's not going to start at Oregon this year. They'll they'll compete, but but he knows it's still in Gabriel's time at Oregon this year. Why do you do that? You do that because you realize you got some development that you need to go through, and so. You know, on first glance, you may look at Jaden Rashad and say, oh, he's got to go somewhere he can start immediately. Where's the depth chart favorable? No. Maybe you look at a place where the depth chart's loaded. Maybe you look at a place where a quarterback's already entrenched, could be a Heisman contender or something like that for all I know this year. I'm not talking about a place, a place specifically just yet. I'm saying don't automatically assume the soft, more favorable depth chart is the place a, kid's gonna, a kid like that's going to land. So Jaden Rashad is in the portal. All right, so who else is there? Dominic Williams at TCU is one of the highest rated guys over on 247sports.com right now that we have a 6'2", 320-pound defensive lineman. Those guys are worth their weight in beyond gold this time of year, as we all know. He started every game the past two years at TCU. He's been all Big 12 caliber player the past couple of years. Oklahoma and Texas are in here, and I'm banking very heavily on this weekend being a big weekend for them. They got the spring game this weekend, which, according to our dutiful reporter in the field, Gabe Eichert, is still on. And I know they've got, I think they've got him in there, and they got a couple other guys they're targeting. So Dominic Williams, let's pay attention to him. Keandre Lambert-Smith was Penn State's leading wide receiver last year. And because it's still pretty light in the portal when it comes to the wide receiver position, his name is at a premium. Now, his production tailed off last year, and, you know, the ending of his Penn State tenure was what it was. But you've got Auburn, uh, A&M, I think, have already secured visits. West Virginia's been mentioned here. Colorado's been mentioned here. I saw Georgia mentioned. I don't think Georgia's going to factor in it with him. At least that's not what I hear. Uh, So that's the latest on him. Jason Zandamella was the interior offensive lineman. Out there at USC. Now, this one's interesting to me. I had some people reaching out throughout spring, and it was starting to become pretty well known. He wasn't long for USC. Just some, call it complications with NIL, to be very broad, uh, because it is what it is. But he wants to get back closer to home. Home for him would be in the state of Florida. So I think, you know, Florida State's going to look. They cannot visit him until next week because of sanctions from whatever, the Amarius Mims recruitment a couple of years ago. Uh, but Florida State, I think, will factor there. We're at Miami today. I kick the tires around here. I think they'll factor there. I I don't get the sense that this is going to be some knockdown, drag-out war. U, UCF probably factors in here as well. Good player. Good player. I'm not trying to downgrade him, um, but not necessarily sure this is the kind of recruitment that you're going to see headlines on every hour on the hour, if that makes any sense to you. What about Cormani McLean? Since we're in Miami, Cormani McLean, former five-star defensive back from this neck of the woods, doesn't land at Miami, lands at Colorado. It's one of Dion's big gets. You remember that. And then Dion takes to criticizing his work ethic and takes to criticizing his preparation and how committed he was, and this was last year, Uh, because a lot of those kids, when they were brought in, they were not brought in to develop. They were brought in straight out of high school to play, and some of them did, and some of them didn't, and some of them have hopped in the portal, and Cormani McLean's now one of them. Uh, Tough love. I I didn't necessarily have a problem how Dion handled that. I think we talked about it on the show at the time, but he's the number three available player in the portal. Now, they don't include me on portal rankings. I'm not sure I'd have Cormani McLean that high. has nothing to do with his physical skill set. I just wonder from the neck up, where is he? Literally, I wonder. I don't know. I haven't evaluated him myself. But, you know, if he's prepared, if he's ready mentally, he can be a big-time player. USC has been mentioned there. Uh, I think if he tries to come closer to home, if he tries to come back to Florida, not sure Miami is involved there uh, this time around. Just That's my feel on it. Um, USF, though could be a very interesting landing spot. Uh, Demarcus Van Dyke, who, friend of the program, first off, who was at Miami at the time they were recruiting him. He's now over in Tampa with Alex Golish and company at USF. They could figure prominently, and, I mean, that would be, I know our buddy Cole Kublik doesn't like this language. That could be a grand slam. He doesn't like us saying home run, so forget about that. We're loading the bases. That would be a grand slam for them. So let's keep an eye on that. Also, Damian Martinez is a running back that was at Oregon State. Now, we... Went and saw Damian Martinez in person last year on the Once Upon a Saturday tour. He's good. Two-time All-Pac-12 and is in the portal now. 
and he's got Arizona, Mississippi State, Tennessee, Kentucky, Miami all there. I'd consider Miami my favorite. I know they had their in-home last night. Uh, he's going through the process, so that's that's by no means locked up, and I'm not trying to suggest it is, uh, but that, that's going to be a big-time contributor and big-time ad for whoever lands him. The one thing that I've I've had mentioned to me by coaches earlier today, namely a couple who have faced him, would be that his skill set may be better fit or may fit better in an offense that's not tempo based, no huddle, hurry up. It's probably a skill set uh, that's more conducive to eh, what you want to call a pro style offense, if that's what you want to call it. So transfer portal. Maybe the maybe the fireworks were just wet at the beginning, but starting to pop a little bit here. Again, it's not necessarily something we're pulling for, we're not rooting for it, uh, but it's reality. And so we're in other words, we're not sounding the all clear. The other night, I wasn't going to sound the all clear because we got 12 hours into this thing without any big-time names. Now, I will tell you a couple of things that are working in your favor if you don't want this to be explosive. Number one, SEC teams cannot go after SEC players. If they do, they got to sit out a year. So you don't have SEC on SEC crime. And so I think a lot of the collectives out there also heavily invested in maintaining their priority players, which means you don't have a ton of resource left to go after big-name players, and the biggest spenders, largely in the SEC, cannot go after the talent pool that most readily would fit on their rosters. And for that reason, hey, hey, maybe, maybe this is as loud as it gets, or maybe the next 72, 96 hours will be totally chaotic. Who knows? Glad to have you guys in. It's a Thursday night. We've got Mario Cristobal coming up for a lengthy conversation on the show. Look, if you're new here, if you're a Miami fan and you don't normally watch the show, I'd consider watching the show. Selfishly, I think we do a pretty good job here. Subscribe to the channel, though. This is not some test run. We do this thing free. We do this thing year-round. It's wall-to-wall college football. You will not hear a second of NBA playoff coverage here because there are other places that do that better. Just subscribe to the channel, or if you're listening on podcast, subscribe to the podcast. That's all we ask. Maybe maybe thumbs up the video, but largely just subscribe, and that helps us out. All right. <clears throat> I saw you guys asking, and so I'm going to talk about it. <sighs> Seems like it's been a while since we did one of these, but we're going to do it. What's happening with Deion Sanders at Colorado? You see the question on the screen there. What's the deal with Deion in Colorado right now? It seems like Colorado is going to have another year to forget. The screen's small. I can't see it. Basically, they're saying, well, is Colorado going to implode this year? I'm not ready to say that, but I am noticing what you guys are noticing. All right, so earlier today, I think it was today, Deion was talking to the media, and they were asking him about all the transfer portal exits and they've had several guys hop in the portal and that's going to be the case with Colorado every year they employ this strategy they're going to have a lot of guys come in they're going to have a lot of guys go out so Dion I'm not paraphrasing all this I don't have the quote in front of me but Dion basically said in his press conference you haven't been paying attention in practice right who have we lost who have we really lost and what he was implying was we haven't lost difference makers we've lost guys who we could afford to lose or who we may even have wanted to hit the exit door I personally, that's not the way I look at it, but it's his roster. It's not my roster. But he did say, we're good. I trust our recruiting team. I trust our coaches. Please have some faith in me. We're good. We're all right. So there's no alarm being sounded publicly by the head coach there at Colorado. And in his own words there, that was a quote, in his own words, they're good. They're all right. Now, I've avoided the whole knee-jerk thing with Colorado. I think there's some revisionist history on that because I, I think – when they started to garner a ton of attention, like many other people who cover college football, I talked about it a lot on the show. Uh, my basic message the entirety of September is this is pretty incredible to watch because I didn't even think they beat TCU. You know, So when they beat TCU, that's pretty incredible. I mean, that's a legitimate story. I thought it was the biggest story in September in college football last year. None of that had anything to do with what my record prediction was for them. A lot of folks went far enough to change their record predictions and started talking about how they may be able to win the Pac-12, rest in peace, old girl, and how they may be a fringe playoff team, and that was nonsense. Those people were not nonsensical people. I think some people who were otherwise very smart just got caught up in that, that wave of Dion hype, the Dion tax, if you will. And so I avoided the knee-jerk there. 
I don't always, but I avoided it there. I'm going to avoid it here, too. I'm not ready to say this season's going to be a disaster because there'll be time for that. If I think they're going to go three and nine, I got time to predict that. Uh, but God did not create April for us to start predicting teams to go three and nine. Well, he didn't make it for me to predict it. But I do have some fundamental beliefs about how I think this sport works, okay? I got fundamental beliefs about how winning happens in college football. And one of those fundamental beliefs is you will never build a sustained winning program through the portal. You will not. You can use the portal to supplement. You can use the portal as a jump starter, like I think Mike Norvell in Florida State brilliantly did. You can use it to backfill. You can use it to add cherries on top. But the Sunday better be made through the portal. You can add all the things onto the house you want. The house better be built. The foundation better be laid, uh, not through the portal, but through traditional high school recruiting. So in a, in a way, nothing's changed there. You just have some more talent acquisition mechanisms afforded to you, which may lead some of my Clemson fans to say, well, if you believe that, why do you harp so much on Dabo's unwillingness to use the portal? Because I think it is valuable. It's a valuable asset at your disposal. It's a tool. It's a resource. Like I said, you can jumpstart. Uh, you can backfill. You can address a specific glaring need. You can supplement. You just don't use it to build. Deion Sanders is taking a different approach. He thinks what I'm saying does not apply. That is not his philosophy. He, he and I don't share the same belief on this, apparently. He believes that you can do this thing, and modern college football will let you do this through the portal. I don't believe that. I, I just... I've been driving around Florida all week. You will never drive through Florida without interstate construction somewhere. But at least when those projects are going on, you got to you got to temporarily deviate lanes and whatnot. At least there's an end goal. Like at least eventually that interstate's going to be completed, only for another project to, to take effect for the next ten years. But what what they're doing is like. That that never stops. Like those temporary lanes, that's just the interstate. And hopefully it works out every single year. And I just don't think that's the way I could ever expect it to go down. And I'll tell you this, too. Colorado just moved to the Big 12. And you may think to yourself, ooh, if they just load up a roster, the Big 12 is very winnable. Well, the Big 12 is winnable in a sense that it's competitively balanced. And the Big 12 is winnable in a sense that, hey, it feels like eight or nine teams any given year could win that thing. But if you think you're about to portal your way to overwhelming, consistent success in the Big 12 through the portal, you got another thing coming, man. The Big 12 is not the land of five-star recruiting giants. The Big 12 is the land of evaluation, development, culture, and bringing kids in a class and watching them grow three and four years together and then winning three or four years after they enrolled. And, man, I don't care how many of them were four and five stars. Most of them weren't. But I'm telling you, if you watch Kansas State play, Utah's in that conference now. Watch Iowa State any given year. Watch TCU any given year. They're, they may have their five and sevens as well. But any given Saturday when you're facing those teams, man, you got to beat them. It's tough. They're like little bowling balls, but they're programs in that they just roll right at you. They're very tightly compacted because they're made of the right stuff. It doesn't, it doesn't mean they're going to pump kids into the first round of the NFL draft, but they're made of the right stuff. In a classical sense, it's exactly what football teams should look like. If you're old school, the Big 12 is your conference. That's exactly what they should look like. Colorado doesn't look like that. Are you going to portal guys in? and magically snap your fingers, and in a few months that becomes a team that's ready to beat a lot of fourth- and fifth-year program guys every single year? Because what's the goal at Colorado? The goal is not to make a bowl. That's not how they're talking. They're talking about playoff out there. So Colorado or anyone else, point blank, you could try this in the SEC for all I care. You are not portaling your way to being a consistent playoff-contending program. I don't believe that. I don't believe it'll ever be the case. I do believe that you could greatly enhance your life, maybe even your chances at the playoff, if you just shop at Academy Sports and Outdoors more. Uh, you, again, we may have some new listeners and viewers tonight. Academy is our lifelong partner. They've been with us nearly from the beginning. They're your one-stop shop for all things outdoor, sporting goods, and beyond. 
Um, you got grills there. You know, of course, you got Big League Chew in the checkout line. At this point, if you live a more minimalist lifestyle, I'm not sure what else you need. Maybe some odds and ends, certain medicines Academy may not carry, but by and large, they got everything you need. You can 95% live your life with a trip or two to Academy. And if you can't get there in person, academy.com is the direction to go. We appreciate them as always, and I think you would too. Just give them a try. As I always say, tell them I sent you. It doesn't get you a discount, but it does make us look a whole lot better as a show. All right, a couple of more quick things here, and then we are going to get Mario Cristobal on the show. The Tennessee Mood Tracker. It's time. We spun the wheel. It landed on Knoxville, Tennessee tonight. This is just a thing that we like to do this time of year that takes the temperature of the fan base. I think it's a really good resource and exercise for us all. If you want to have a full grasp of how college football folks are really feeling. And at Tennessee, it's just in Nico we trust. That's the entire mood. Nico Iamaliava is in there. That's the quarterback. And what's funny about this is for a long time, I tried to overthink the room on how this sport works. What I mean by that is everyone wanted to focus on quarterback. I'd look at all the preview magazines. It's just littered with quarterbacks. And then quarterback, oh, it's the most important position. It's the hardest position, blah, blah, blah. And I would say, you know, I'm going to spend more of my time talking about tight ends. I'm going to spend more of my time talking about outside linebackers. And those are valuable positions. And you got some great players there. But quarterbacks impact this game to a 10-time ratio of any other position. And it don't overthink the room on this. If Tennessee has got a superstar quarterback, that's how Tennessee could win a national championship. So if Nico Iamaliava ends up fulfilling on the immense potential and hype that he had and we think he has when he was coming out of high school, he's not a freshman, not a true freshman, but um, if he is that guy, I mean, that's how Tennessee does it. Uh, because Joe Milton wasn't that guy last year, and that's why Tennessee didn't do it. It's not rocket science. Now, I don't think we can all throw on headsets and call plays like Josh Heupel, but he knows what I'm saying is true as well. That's why he went and recruited the guy. That Bama 2022 game, I think, broke down a lot of mental barriers there. Tennessee fans know exactly what I'm talking about, but there were just some things that you had, you had conditioned yourself to think wouldn't change until. And after the word until, when you filled in that blank, it was until we beat Bama. Fifteen years in a row is a long time, man. You got kids with learner's permits that weren't born the last time they had beaten Bama. Well, they did it, and it, it, it's not that they won the SEC that year. They didn't even play for it. But what it did is it cleared this gigantic mental hurdle that allowed people to start thinking bigger around there. And with good reason, you should. I've never bought into the notion that Tennessee all of a sudden became a program that couldn't do this or that, couldn't win the SEC, couldn't make the playoff. They just haven't. They haven't because they haven't been good enough at head coach. That also is not rocket science. Their over-under win total is 9.5 this year. That's equivalent with Alabama. That's equivalent with LSU. That's equivalent with Ole Miss. These are teams that will be mentioned in the SEC championship picture, which means Tennessee should be mentioned in the SEC championship picture. Very simply, that will depend on how good a quarterback Nico Amaliava is. It sounds like fundamental fifth-grader logic it is. Some fifth graders are pretty smart, by the way. They had their own TV show for a long time, hosted by Jeff Foxworthy, who frequents Harris County restaurants, mind you. Um, they, they feel to me like a just-get-in kind of team in the expanded playoff era, by the way. I used to I, – I love Major League Baseball, but back in the day in the four-team playoff era in baseball as well, I really loved Major League Baseball in the regular season. It always aggravated me that the structure was such that – the Braves could win 103 regular season games and the Astros or Marlins or someone get hot at the very end and then all of a sudden they're the team you don't want to face. Well, is there a program that becomes that way? Is there a program that's good for a couple of regular season losses but when they get in the playoff all of a sudden it's like lightning in a bottle? If there is that program, Tennessee feels like with this kind of quarterback they could be that sort of program. And I have no basis to go on because we've never seen an expanded college football playoff. But it feels like they're a just-get-in kind of team. So let's say they stumble a couple of times this year. And by the way, it's the SEC, so pretty much everyone's going to stumble at least once, if not two or three times. If they get hot at the end of the year, if Nico is playing his best ball at the end of the year, if those receivers they brought in, let's say they're injured early, not the receiver position, but in general. Let's say they're banged up early. That team gets hot. That's the team that feels like it's scale potential or um, productivity at the end of the year. And then you get in. And whomst amongst us knows what can happen. So that's the Tennessee mood tracker. 
And then I follow it up with one more thing, which I kind of put this in the show because it kind of aligns with that. And we'll have Mario Cristobal right after this. I had a question. I think it's a Twitter question, actually. So, as you know, we got we got to expand the playoff coming up. One of you asked, hey, what are the odds we see repeat champs? You know, we've seen Bama repeat. Like, we, we in the past 14 playoff era, you saw teams repeat as national champs. How likely or unlikely is that in an expanded playoff era? I think it's less likely. I think, obviously, the trade-off is it's much more likely you'll have more teams run off a string of playoff appearances. I have no clue how Georgia will ever miss the playoff. When you look at the way they recruit, and you look at how much lower the bar is to make the college football playoff, I have no clue how they'll ever miss it. They can lose three games many years and probably still make it in. Are they more likely to string together national championships? They just came off back-to-back title wins themselves. I should have mentioned them instead of Bama. Are they more or less likely to do that? I think anyone's less likely to do that because the randomization is in play here. Football is not nearly as randomized as a game like basketball or a game like baseball. That's why those sports play series instead of games when they get in a playoff setting and football just plays a game. I don't mean the randomization as in bounce of ball. Yes, that matters. But in the playoffs, about seven or eight times out of ten, the better team has won on the football field. I'm talking about how much injury plays a part when you add in two or three games on top of what you already had to win. And then you add in all the other stuff. And you you may have a team that goes undefeated regular season, and then over the span of their conference title game and then their first-round playoff game, they lose two marquee premier game changers, and then you draw them. How in the world are they about to repeat? In the old system, they would have. So I think that plays a part. I think there's a new criticism, by the way, that will emerge in the expanded playoff era. And that will be that some teams are built to make the playoff, but they're not built to win the playoff. Now, reality will be it's just really hard to win a playoff, to win a national championship. But since there's 12 teams, we got to put 12 in there. There'll be some teams that end up making it that otherwise wouldn't have. And they'll string together a few of those years. And then their fan bases will be inflated with false hope because you'll start to think in the early versions of this expanded playoff, hey, if you make it in, you're good enough to win. And, of course, that's not true. And then uh, you'll fall short. You'll be like March Madness. Your team keeps making the NCAA tournament, but they can't win the national title. Well, a little condensed version of that will be, yeah, they're built to make the college football playoff, but they're not built to win it. Uh, Very few are, friends. Very few are. So... Who becomes that wild card team, though? Who who becomes that team that can just make a run? Just get in. Just get hot. Just get in. Oh, what exciting and and somewhat unpredictable times we find ourselves in. All right, uh, we'll get Mario Cristobal in here in just a second. Firstly, I do want to remind you, I just read you some odds. I gave you those over-under win totals. That's courtesy of our friends at FanDuel. And those aren't just numbers I'm privy to. You can go to FanDuel right now, and you can bet those numbers if you're in a state where it's legal. If you're not in a state where it's legal, or you don't feel like betting, or you don't even like to bet, or you don't even believe in betting, you go look at them anyway. Certainly no harm in that. I do both. And so over-under win totals are there. Odds to win conferences are there. Early games of the year are there. Odds to make versus miss the playoff are there. So there's no shortage of content. And look, like I said, even if you're in the crowd that doesn't bet, that's a great resource. If you if you want more than just what the magazines say or what preseason you know predictions from reporters or even someone like me are, you can go to odds makers and say, well, what do they think? If you understand how to decipher that stuff, and it's not hard, trust me, because even I do it, there it is. There's the best preview magazine in the world. You go to FanDuel and you can look at their futures market. That's a really good preview magazine. There's just not a lot of you know Dennis Dodd length articles along with it, so you got to do that work yourself. All right. Really good conversation coming up here. We've been at Miami all day. It's been great. We saw whatever the plural of IBIS is, IBI. We saw several of them around campus, a couple of wayward iguanas. Not as not as populated with the iguanas today as I would have hoped, but we had great weather. Low humidity. Enjoy that for about 15 more seconds because that's about to change. But we talked to Mario Cristobal at length today about pretty much everything that you'd be talking about. So I just ask you guys, what do you, what do you want to know? And then we, we go to the head coaches because we can get such access, and we talk about it. So I'm going to wrap the show here. It's been a pleasure to talk to you guys tonight. We'll be back live on Sunday. In the meantime, here's our conversation with Kane's head coach, Mario Cristobal. 
So here we are. We're coming out of spring ball. Mm -hmm. We're that close, like 19 Saturdays, if you want me to keep count, until the 2024 season. You guys go to Gainesville to start. But right now, how are we feeling? Where are we at? Great spring. A lot of hard work as it relates to uh, talent acquisition and development. Uh, continuity with our coordinators um, has led to just a lot of progress uh, to build upon some of the progress we had last year. So we feel strongly about our team. We feel strongly about our culture. We feel strongly about entering portal season and, uh, you know, adding a couple pieces here and there. So uh, it's the momentum within the walls of this building uh, could not be stronger. Now, this whole thing's interesting. This, the, the whole concept that you could add starting pieces to your team after spring practice. You could lose starting pieces after spring practice. Um, you, you recruit, man, you're a relentless recruiter like everyone's always known that about you. And then you add portaling into it as well. How up to the minute do you have to be on, above and beyond all your other responsibilities on <laughs> who's in that thing or what you're hearing and what our needs are and what our numbers are in this compartment versus that compartment? Like, you've got people in the room that specialize in that, but ultimately it's on your plate. So how much a day-to-day -day thing does that have to be? Oh, that's, that's up to the second because you just don't know what's, what's really going to transpire out there. And you have a good feel for your roster. But in this day and age with all the stuff that goes on, you've got to be aware and alert to it as well. But, you know, you always have open and honest conversation, very transparent with your people. That's the most important part. And then you assess and see where, where do we need to go? Where do we need to be more competitive? Where do we need an impact player? Where do we need young quality depth? And uh, from there we, we do. We attack the portal in that, that form and fashion. But you've always, just due to the ever-changing, just – world of college football uh, if you do sleep you can you can hurt yourself because you could miss out an opportunity that could be a game changer I had a buddy uh, text me the other day and he said hey what happens when coaches get sick what happens when they have crises he doesn't know to spell it crises but when they have crises in their life uh, you know what what happens when there's a situation at home those guys don't just get to take the day off do they so not me but we'll call him Fred Explain to Fred what happens when you have something going on outside of work. Fred, you're not allowed to get sick. No. I hate to break it to you, buddy. You're not allowed to have a crisis at home. You're not allowed to have a day off. Um, you have a sole purpose and a mission to do everything humanly possible and completely dedicate every ounce of your soul into the program that you are in charge of. And that means every single day, every single minute, every single second. So, yeah, I don't, uh, I've been lucky. You know, I've, my wife is awesome. My kids are awesome. I have family in town, and uh, luckily I have good health. I mean, you've seen the nutritionists right. and their staff here, man. They, they put so many vitamins in you. It's, I mean, it take like the Ebola river virus to get you <laughs> sick around this joint, but no, nah, you just, uh, just got to go. Last time I was here, we were, we're, we're shooting in the indoor, so just over here is the weight room. It's where Aaron Feld lives, mm -hmm. and they had you in there doing some plyometric stuff, some some stretching, some band work, and I didn't see many dumbbells, I didn't see many barbells, have we adjusted the workout at all? You already no, got it in today. No, no, you got us on an energy system type of day. Yeah. You know, we, we wanted to make sure that we had uh, enough uh, weight in the weight room to uh, you know, be able to accommodate uh, your, your lifting needs. You know, so the, I think they shipped in the 200 pound dumbbells <laughs> today and whatnot, but no, uh, later today you'll see the dumbbells and the barbells in effect, you'll see the MMA trainer, here a little bit later as well. We should be fighting for a championship here in Japan in a, in a couple months. Uh, you'll see us back to normal. You know what's amazing? I, I mean, anyone who follows recruiting knows you guys have brought in some pretty big names. And then anyone who watched you last year knows a lot of those young guys popped. I mean, you get to, you get to be around them a lot day to day. Folks at home just see them on Saturdays. Mm -hmm. You can be as specific as you want to be. Like, how, how just raw physically impressive mm -hmm. were some of those guys before they were even handed off to you mm -hmm. and then what have you guys been able to do with them here yeah you know it's um we've been very blessed to have um to some really dedicated committed signees guys that that truly are about just being the best they can be that want to have an impact on others and that like act it out you know culture is not the slogan or it's not the the tweet man it's about action and they are about action that's the best part about these guys and they have personality. They're fun to be around. They're competitive. They go at each other. They draw at each other. Uh, they make practice a lot of fun is what they do. And 
you know, for us, um, you know, we've had a staff that's had, you know, over the years some pretty good continuity. And so it's a little bit of deja vu for us in terms of, okay, it's you're now entering your third year and you've got a lot of pieces that are coming into into play in terms of development, in terms of talent. Um, so people know each other. The relationships are stronger and they're getting better. There's growth, there's development. Um, so they make every day a lot of fun. They make it really, really exciting. And you know what? It, um, we already pour our hearts and souls into this, but it makes you want to pour that much more because they want to do great. They want to win. Uh, they want to do great things. You played here when Miami was at its apex. Mm -hmm. You could call Miami like an apex predator of the sport. Mm -hmm. You've then been elsewhere, and you've watched Miami fluctuate a little bit. You've now come here. You're the head coach. You're a few years in now. Um, it doesn't take long for a generation to happen, right. maybe a 10-year period, let's say. Mm -hmm. And so when you get a couple of generations removed from, from like that brand being known as elite, you still remember it. I still remember it. You played. You, you actually lived it. But a 16, 17, 18-year-old kid, you got to actually tell them. You got to actually point to the banners on the wall. You got to actually pop on the footage and you got to watch the confetti rain down the trophy case. Hey, this happened here one time. Before you ever start, you know, selling guys on this being the place for you, do you ever have to sort of educate on this is what it can be. This is what it was before. I don't care what it's been in your lifetime. This is what it was before. Is that ever kind of an educational opportunity you have to afford kids when you recruit them? Uh, absolutely. And I think, um, you know, a lot of them do know and they, they've seen enough video and they've seen enough other highlight tapes and whatnot. And, you know, for me, it was real simple. It was like, I know what Miami is and should be. I was a very uh, fortunate young man to be a part of it. And so, you know, when you're at a distance and, and fortunate to have success at other places, you know, it, it hurts you. It does. We're finally like enough is enough. You know, we're only on this earth one time and, and just could not go to the grave without getting back to Miami and being a part of making Miami what it should always be. And that's what we've been working on relentlessly. And also knowing that there's work to do. Miami didn't slip overnight, you know, and that you're going to have to invest an extraordinary amount of time and resources into getting it right. And now we feel we're very, we're getting very close. So the best thing for these guys is when we have practices is watching our alumni interact with them. Sometimes during practice, we have to pull them off the field as they're trying to jump out there and coach. But uh, I think a great example was Michael Irvin at our alumni reunion this weekend when uh, the gist of the message was about the work, how much harder practice was and game day, and that's what gave Miami that competitive edge. But he also went to the extent of saying, hey, look, if you're not about winning, you can't be my friend. You know, If you're not willing to hold yourself and others accountable, you really can't be a part of it. So I think it's uh, with all the noise that goes on in the world of sports, I think it's important for them to hear a guy like that say, hey, are you going to listen to – to us as former players and Hall of Famers, you're going to listen to the noise. And it, you know, the answer to that is pretty simple. So you said you feel like you're getting a lot closer to where you want to be. Mm -hmm. Outside world sees five wins the first year, seven wins the second year, and that's really all they have to go on. So aside from the record getting better, mm -hmm. open up the hood for the program. What's different now and how different is it than a year ago and how different could it be a year from now? Sure, the natural progression of a program when you increase the caliber of talent coming in the building, when you go to a strength and conditioning program and a practice regiment that's extremely uh, developmental, one that was used here, that was, um, was used when I was an assistant coach at the University of Alabama, um, that we took out to the University of Oregon and used there as well. I know a lot of other programs uh, have, been, have used that blueprint and have had great success. Um, and it's been implemented here and the development of the players, along with some staff continuity regarding systems or whatnot, just leads to consistent progress. And there's so many areas that we progressed at last year to become a competitive team. Uh, and the result of every game wasn't exactly what we wanted, but some there were. We won some battles that maybe, you know, Miami was not expected to come out on top of. And it was this all progress and inching more closer to what we want to be. Now, that being said, everyone recognizes the amount of work that has to be done going forward. So another year, another offseason, another spring, uh, a great class, some great portal additions, and then culture, culture, culture. Just 
not talking about it, just working, man. Just going to work, just shutting up, cutting out the outside noise, and going to work on what we know works for Miami and worried about nothing else. I don't ever question you guys are serious about culture here. You, I mean, I walk through the building, so I, I see it and I feel it pretty quickly. Well, when you're trying to recruit a guy, you've got a long runway to figure out whether he's about this or whether he's not. Mm -hmm. When you're trying to get a guy out of a portal, sometimes it's 24, 48, 72 hours. How do you figure out whether they're a good fit or not? You've got to have someone or a group of people that know that particular young man. You've got to have a reference that you trust, right? Because just like anything else, a, an addition that hurts and chips away at culture could be absolutely devastating during a rough patch. And one that actually enhances it and one that, uh, that you can trust amongst your players. And now we feel very trusting in terms of that if there's something that's a little bit off, that our players can bring it to cultural standards. Uh, but that being said, I never want to burden them with having to be the ones to do that. It's our job to make sure that we vet everything so we bring something uh, to sit beside them in the locker, to practice with them on the field, to go to, into games on Saturday that they can trust themselves. What's something since you've been the head coach here, not at the core, like the core philosophy never changes, but what's something maybe just on the periphery of that that you remember looking at, taking, it, taking a long, hard think on it and saying, maybe we should tweak this or, or maybe 20% change over here could do good. It could be something about you personally or about the program as a whole. Is there anything that you remember looking at and saying, yeah, we need to modify that a little bit? You mean upon arrival or over the... Since arrival here to present day. Gotcha. Well, I think we're, we're always assessing every part of it, how we do everything, whether um, it be our off-season program, our regimentation, how we call plays, what we call our self-scout. You know, what are we? What do we look like on tape? What are our tells? What are our opponents doing to attack us? And why are we doing well in this and not so well in that? So we take a deep dive into that and certainly study the teams that have done the best both in college and in the NFL to make sure that we, we just find an edge somewhere, somehow. Uh, in terms of the DNA of our program, we always want to enhance that. The best way to do that, in our opinion, is to get to know your people really, really well. And so we do. We take a deep dive into our people and do our best to always increase the, the strength of the connection, you know, the strength of affiliation, of care factor within the program. Uh, and what we have found out is that the more time you spend around people, right, the more people realize the importance of time and there's nothing more important you can give someone than your time. So we feel like this group has become really tight um, with a chip on their shoulder with a lot to prove, and I think the staff feels that same way. So um, this offseason has been really, really good, really strong. Uh, we just we haven't played a game yet, so we don't get ahead of ourselves and, and get into, uh, you know, over, over pushing and over hyping certain aspects. We, uh, we're really, really excited. I've always said if you could take a person off the street, and put them in, a, in an off-season lifting program, go through spring ball, go through summer conditioning, even if they didn't have the God-given ability, if they could just exist in that environment, all of them would feel like a million bucks, and all of them, if they had any kind of mental toughness about themselves, mm -hmm. they'd be ready to go conquer nations come fall. Then if they're trailing 17 to six at halftime of week one in the locker room, mm -hmm. they'd, be, they'd be devastated and they'd be shell-shocked. How do you make sure guys mentally are programmed to where you, know, you challenge them enough in this setting mm -hmm. here to where when it actually doesn't fully go your way in the fall, you're not rattled. Like guys keep their composure right. and you're getting the same kind of efficiency out of them. Yeah, no, it's a great question because you could talk it all you want. You could show all the highlight films and all the teaching tapes about, you know, this is, uh, let's talk about situational football and if this happens. That's fine. And you know what? And I love our strength and conditioning program. I put it up against any, any program in the country. But the weight doesn't push back. You know, the, the intervals, they don't, they don't push back. Out there, it's human resistance, right? So the only way we know how and we've ever known as, as players, and in fact, today, Coach Dave Wanstatt, our defense coordinator back in the day here at Miami, he came by this morning, and we were talking about that. It's with all the things and all the, you know, the books and the templates and all the, you know, all the teachings and sayings, the one thing that always stood the test of time was the way that you practice. And 
and I think the value and um, I would say the uh, the caliber of a good football coach by position, coordinator, or head coach is by his ability to construct and organize a great football practice because that's the only way to get true testing as it relates to human resistance, right? To something fighting back, pushing back, creating the type of physical, mental adversity that's going to show up. You can't simulate, you know, 80, 90,000 people, you know, throwing all kinds of stuff at you and yelling at you, but you can simulate that gut-wrenching, relentless pounding of a tempo offense, or you can replicate, you know, that, that fourth and one situation when a guy is dead tired after going a 14 play drive you got to do it out there so it's on us to duplicate those scenarios and situations as much as possible what's wild is if you're in a competitive setting in the business world mm -hmm. and someone embarrasses you mm -hmm. someone runs circles around you you can go hide in your office you can <laughs> sit in the parking lot you can take a sick day the next day a db gets beat yeah. and looks foolish and has to be there again 18 seconds later and to me, like I'm now talking personally, a DB's ability to have a short memory and to be 100% and fully engaged mentally the following play, like I don't know if that's something many freshmen walk in the door with, and some, sometimes maybe guys never have it, but the ones, and you've, you've actually played on teams with some of the great ones, the ability to have a short memory, that position or any position, yeah. is, it's fascinating to me when guys possess that. Yeah, they, they just don't care about that last play they just don't care they're just focused on kicking somebody's you know what and those guys and as many of those guys as you can have on your roster the better you'll be off because all they care about is that next play and whooping somebody's butt you know and that is you know we seek that mentality you know when we um when we have unofficial visitors we like getting them here around practice and watching like a real deal up close and personal like get after it practice because it attracts you or it you know, makes you maybe go somewhere else because it's not your cup of tea. So um, these games are gonna be settled right up front on the perimeter, but it's gonna be settled in some type of legitimate competitive battle that's gonna, you know, the game's gonna teeter on and you've gotta have guys that truly can just focus on that one particular moment to have them to have them have their best chance of success. You know? how, how common is it to have a guy you're recruiting check all the physical boxes, looks amazing, you wouldn't change a thing about him if you could, but when you start that evaluation of the neck up, he, he doesn't have it and you're so mad because you wish you could take a two-star two head and put it on top of that five-star body. How often does that happen? How frustrating is it when a guy doesn't have that most important piece of the puzzle and you you can't really there's not much you can do you can develop the other stuff in the weight room maybe you, yeah. you there's no shortcut to developing that yeah you know you've evaluation identification really override recruiting right i mean you've got to really identify the right ones before you get into the part where you really you know want to attract this person to come to university but they've got to be attracted for the right reasons so you, you really got to find that out and the only way to find that out is to go watch practice hopefully watch a game where they're ahead by a few or behind by a few and watch that reaction. But how frustrating is that? Um, man, you know, it's, but at the same time, you know what? Part of recruiting is as important to eliminate prospects as it is to fill that board up with the ones you're going after. Last year, turnovers were an issue at critical times in big games. So there's like a 50,000 foot question of how do you fix turnovers? And I could ask you that, and you've probably given that answer a million times. I'd prefer to ask you about the change at quarterback where you brought Cam Ward in here, mm -hmm. and that looked like a little dicey. Is it going to be NFL? Is it going to be Miami? So as much as you can, walk me through that process, and then what did you get from him so far in spring? Uh, that was a very interesting and new recruiting experience process. It was no longer competing against other schools. It was competing against the NFL. Yeah. So um, we, um, Reese as well, Reese is a, is a great player coming over from Albany, and he was on his way down, and Cam, um, he had chosen to go to the NFL, you know. So, uh, but we stayed on, you know. We stayed on relatively consistently and trying to figure some things out, and it was um, – 
I don't remember exactly. It was 6:42 p.m. You know. <laughs> I don't remember exactly the second, but the minute you know. was 6:42. <laughs> but yeah, uh, I see a face on coming. In. I'm like, man, what does this guy want? You know, better not to be to, to rub it in about his you know NFL workouts and whatnot. And get on the FaceTime, big old smile, and he says, I don't want to be a Miami Hurricane. And it's like. We're announcing this yeah. like now, all right? This is going to be point of no return. But um, there was a connection there from the beginning. I think everyone felt it was right. It was just a matter of is this going to happen now? Is it going to happen later? Because it feels right. And it ended up happening. And what we've got um, ourselves a tremendous blessing, first and foremost, as a human being and as a relentless competitor, because he's an alpha. Okay, and an alpha at quarterback is a game changer. If you watch the film, you'll see all the, the great things he does. I'm, you know, I've spoken uh, just volumes in terms of his ability uh, to make things happen, extend plays, explosive plays, see the field, make great decisions, all that stuff. And we can go on and on about the tangibles, all the intangible stuff. His ability to just lead, to be a true field general to play with just practice, I should say. We haven't had a game with him yet, but to practice with that type of just, to have those kind of guts and confidence and demand that of his teammates and teammates demand that of him without any sensitivity getting in the way and not allowing anything to get in the way except performance. Um, he's, he's got all of us really, really fired up. I think it was interesting. I was down here a few weeks ago, three weeks ago, I guess it was, and watched practice. You guys are in the middle of spring ball at that point, and he's out there, and it's he stands out. I mean, it's it's pretty apparent pretty mm -hmm. quickly. And we went off to the side. We watched some cut ups, some all twenty two of him, and you didn't have to say a word. All you did was he'd make a throw, hit through the window, and you just kind of look at me, nod your head. Next, nod your head. And mm -hmm. I'm sitting there thinking to myself, although football doesn't work this way. If I were to have inserted that ability on last year's team, I don't know how different the wins and losses look, mm -hmm. but he's going to be, God willing, injury notwithstanding on this year's team, mm -hmm. he's going to be involved in inevitably some one possession games either way. Mm -hmm. And seven and five versus 10 and three, in terms of a coach's reputation, there's a gulf between it. Mm -hmm. But really, it's just a bounce here or a drop ball there or a turnover here. And I don't know, I don't know how close you feel like you guys were last year. Mm -hmm. Do you feel like you were better than your record said you were or mm -hmm. worse than your record said you were? But I, the margins of this game, being as small as they are, mm -hmm. what does a presence like that, along with the rest of the roster elevating, right. mean in terms of potential? Because that's all it is in spring, potential. Yeah, it's, oh, it's a massive addition. I mean, let's call it what it is. Um, I wish... I wish you could see this part is after practice, how he rounds up the receivers and go and go right to the film, go right to it and talk through it or stay out here with them or they grab him and they're talking about this particular concept against this coverage. What am I seeing? What am I expecting from you? Well, I saw this. You saw that. Well, this is how we're going to do it. Just very directive oriented, uh, very just alpha in terms of that. And then go back to this last week and he's got all the linemen just eating every ounce of food in the city of Miami at his house you know like um, he gets it and it's it's been it's just been a very strong welcoming presence for our team uh, and it's backed up by his performances in practice you guys um, obviously you had a lot of young guys here last year that you had to rely on I assume you probably will play a lot of young guys again this year so um, what what if anything, I'm not asking you, do you sacrifice your standard? You never do that. But mm -hmm. are there some things fundamentally that you change when you know we're going to have a lot of guys on the field that haven't been here four or five years? Right. It, it may be that we load them up with less or it may be that we call a certain thing a different way. What from a coach's perspective changes when you know average age on this team is far younger than some years I've been a coach? Sure. No, I, you said it perfectly, and I think every single person um, that coaches here has to think players over plays. It's the bottom line. We have some great stuff drawn up, but if we're not ready to run it, there's no point in running it. We have to design and call it, and I think our coordinators have done a really good job with that and evolving more. I mean, I, I love what we did in the spring, um, and they really tailored things to bring along the guys so they could learn the system 
find out what they can do well, and then really push the envelope the last two weeks to see what, what, what is the capacity, because that capacity week to week during the season is really tested, right? You go from, not that we play many wing T teams nowadays, but you'll go from a power spread to a pro style offense to a tempo offense. You'll see a lot of different stuff. And if a guy shows capacity, uh, along with the ability to make plays within the system, now, now coordinators have a little bit more flexibility, but if not, players over place. A whole lot's changing about the sport. I think, um, you know, you were at Alabama under Nick Saban. Mm -hmm. So Nick Saban retires. Right. And that, that impacts Alabama, impacts the SEC, but it impacts all of college football. Mm -hmm. It's just a massive ripple effect. Uh, do you remember where you were, by the way? When you heard the news that he was retiring, do <laughs> you remember where you were? I don't, man. Or what your reaction was. I know it was working. So uh, it's, in a sense, um, no one coach and happy for him. You know, and at the same time, it's like, man, wow, no one would ever, no one ever thought that day would really, really come. Everyone knows it's coming for everybody, but that would really, really come. But I mean, what can, what can you say about the guy? The guy's done more for college football than maybe anybody in his history. So, uh, but happy for him because he's got, uh, you know, he's got a great family. He's got his, his grandkids, you know, he's got his 19,000 Mercedes dealership. <laughs> you should probably give a Mercedes to every assistant coach to help him recruit great players, you know. Put that on there, but uh, no, he's um, he certainly had such an impact on on everyone that has either played for him or coached for him that nothing but but happy for the for him. I was gonna so going up there, it was always interesting. You would go behind the scenes and you would see just the army of people who worked there. Most of the names you would not have known mm -hmm. unless you went inside the building. So then some of those guys move on. They get head jobs here, head jobs there. And you were talking earlier, for example, about strength and conditioning. There may be a lot of elements that I noticed there that once upon a time I would have seen in Tuscaloosa. Mm -hmm. Can you remember maybe some of the other things you would have picked up there or some of the other things you just observed at other places along the way that sort of went into building the Lego house that ended up being what Miami is right now? Yeah, I think the, the biggest thing in, in all those places, um, the guys that I had the blessing to work for that were really, really good, always shared the, the mentality as it relates to complacency. They just refused to allow complacency to seep into the building as it relates to anything. And I thought uh, great examples were made by guys like Coach Saban, you know, saying like, if, if you're pushing a player to do all this extra work, to work on this part of his game, well, I'm going to push you as an assistant coach to improve your teaching progressions to improve the way that you present your indie drills and make them more relatable to game day actual like play um, and name it from the way a guy recruits a presentation, the way he's on the road, the way he presents himself, uh, grooming a guy to be a coordinator. I, he just, him and some of these other guys, they just, they made it a staple to challenge everyone in the building, including oneself. Without that, there's no growth. So I think uh, getting comfortable being uncomfortable and then regimentation, like the actual calendar, like from, you know, Coach Fell, from the rep count as it relates to the, the splits, the splits uh, jerk or, or the clean, you know, in combination with the heavy squat, day, whatever the synchronization of the programs are and the rep count and the buildup to be able to be effective and the different position specific exercises and development. I thought all that stuff was fascinating. The, the, the bricks, the sticks, all the other, I, I don't care about that stuff. To me, it was all the level of professionalism and the people that could teach guys to improve and reach their goals. So you guys are really, really bunkered in football 24-7, 365, which I appreciate because that's all I talk about all year. So it really <laughs> works out for me. Do you have, what kind of level of awareness do you feel like you have mm -hmm. on things going on outside the football world? Oh, God. I don't care what it is, world issues, political, whatever, like how, how out to left field do you feel like you are on just stuff that other people are consumed with? Because I get lost, mm -hmm. I don't know what's happening, and I don't have a fraction on my plate that you have on your plate. Yeah, I mean, I get a briefing, you know, at the wee hours when I get home, and, and the wife tells you, realize, blank. I'm like, <laughs> no, thank you for letting me know, you know, or, uh, or I get a text from, you know, uh, a college teammate, you know, or, uh, you know, any, a former coach, you know, from, uh, from a famous wrestler passing away, you know, to um, to an event from a family member or a teammate or uh, something happened on in the community, it's uh, it's just it, the job has changed. Yeah, 
it just consumes if you want to do it right if you want to do right by the players if you want to give your assistant coaches a chance to maximize their abilities as a head coach and that's that's my belief i'm not saying it's the right way but you you need to completely entrench yourself and to use every minute you can to make things better for all those around you you got both coordinators here again this year mm -hmm. and this time last year you you could not have been more effusive in your praise of those guys both louisiana guys that you brought in mm -hmm. and they talk like it and they feel like it when you're around <laughs> them and now they're down in south florida but year two tangibly on the field what's the difference how big is the impact there well you know they both re i think respectively we jumped anywhere between 60 and 80 spots you know total offense and defense um and in just about every area of massive improvement and the areas that Sony worked third down in red zone can really put us over the top systematically and as an organization. Them having an entire off season and a spring, a chance to self-assess uh, for us to get together and really just cross-examine. Uh, I, very few things are as important as whether it be system or people continuity. If you could have both, great. If you could have one, it's still ultra valuable. This year we got both of those things. Uh, it's awesome. Those guys are elite human beings, elite coaches. I love what they've done in the spring to continue to help us to evolve uh, and to be more connected to our players as well. So I'm looking forward to a great year from both those guys. Who, pound for pound, who's the funniest guy on that staff right now? I don't know if anybody's funny, you know? I mean, wow. <laughs> I, uh, man. You know, it doesn't, it doesn't strike me. They all got a lot of energy. They all worked their, their tails off. Probably some of the GAs, some of the analysts, um, they probably have a little bit more personality. Um, man, funny. I don't know. I can't say I've heard a good joke from them in a long time, but they, they bring great energy, so they're awesome That people. makes up for it. Yeah, I, you know, no one strikes me as a Rodney Dangerfield type in there. So when you come out of spring ball, Aside from the usual things that are non-negotiables every year, mm -hmm. if I were in your office and there was a grease board and two or three big bullet points for 2024 were on it, what are those things that you think will make the difference with this team this fall? Just two. You can go three if you want. You know what? We got unlimited film. It's a digital world. Now you go all day if you want to. Mm -hmm. Man. We've got, the, I could show you the grease board later. I could show you the, the bullet points that we took. You know, we, we had some things that had to become second nature for us in spring football, you know. And uh, as it relates to the football itself, securing the football, you mentioned earlier from a turnover standpoint, we didn't secure the football well enough and we didn't create enough turnovers. So the ball itself, ball disruption and ball security, were at a premium. The second part is the way we played the game was inconsistent. You know, and this has to be a team that all the time plays to its absolute max capabilities from an effort standpoint. A team that, that has talent, um, but that doesn't have that consistently is going to show up inconsistently on Saturdays. But a team that has talent that can play that hard is really hard to beat. And we want to become that team by practicing it, by upping our strength conditioning program and everything else that goes with that. And then, of course, the culture. I mean, Michael Irvin said it best the other day when he said, if, if you're not about winning, you know, you can't be my friend. You know, <laughs> I mean, he took it to the extreme. Uh, but we all know what he said. You know, he wanted to make it clear to, to everybody here that when you, when you wear that, that you on your helmet, when you wear it on your shirt, it's a way of life. It's how you do anything. It's how you do everything. You want to make it clear that accountability has to be about action. And a player-led team can take an organization program to new heights. Let's go get some Cuban food for lunch. Mario Cristobal, we appreciate so, it, man. You got it.